hello. I am Heather Shurtia, the Executive Director of Digital Wish, and we are on a mission to solve the digital divide. If you're watching this webinar today, that means you need some funding and we know where it is. I've got two of the top top experts in E-rate funding and in all the other grants that are available for federal funding uh, here with me today. I've got John Harrington from Funds for Learning. He's the CEO. He is an expert on E-rate and he's going to tell us all about $7.1 billion that's coming down the pipeline for laptops and hotspots and how you qualify for that. And then I've got Melissa Griggs here. She writes grants for Zoom. So either one of these two experts could write grants for you if you want them to. So I'm gonna throw it to John and we are gonna explore $7.1 billion in funding because that sounds fantastic. Hey, Heather, uh, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And yeah, it really is a fantastic time uh, to be looking at opportunities to help connect students. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the last year, has just sort of laid bare this this need that we know has been there for quite some time and that is keeping students school staff library patrons connected to the internet wherever they're at and uh, this past month the federal communications commission uh, the fcc just launched the emergency connectivity fund uh, that's the seven billion dollar program it's a one-time program that's going to be providing wi-fi hotspots and laptops and tablets to students, staff, and library patrons who otherwise lack that connectivity or those devices. So it's a really, uh, it's a great program, and uh, we're just in the middle right now of seeing how it's uh, unfolding. So John, um, we've been delivering hotspots to schools for years through uh, Mobile Beacon and through our connectivity programs where we do internet at 10 bucks a month with hotspots. And I mean, for years we've been hearing schools, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, and all of a sudden there's $7 billion that's available to fund hotspots and close the digital divide. This is the biggest windfall we, I, I have ever seen in education to come down to get kids connected, to get them laptops and to get them online. And we are super excited, but also terrified at the same time because it's coming down so rapidly. Can you talk about the funding window and how quickly schools need to apply and what do they need to do to prepare? Because it is coming like a freight train. So, yes. So it, it is it is the proverbial, uh, you know, sort of uh, wait, 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 and then hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for years for this support. And, you know, here we are now uh, confronted with this opportunity. Uh, seven billion dollars there will be a filing window that will open uh, by the first of july it could be the end of june could be early july uh, just sort of in your mind you can think july 1st and this is for schools and libraries and it's for the same schools and libraries that apply for e-rate funding so my day job is helping schools and libraries navigate the e-rate funding process so the e-rate competitive bidding the application cycle the payment process audits all of that stuff, we've done it for the past 24 years. Uh, Funds for Learning works with schools and libraries nationwide, helping them go through this E-rate funding process. And what's interesting about the Emergency Connectivity Fund, the ECF, we call it, uh, this new $7 billion program, is that it's leveraging all of the E-rate application infrastructure. So, uh, for example, the funding application uh, is going to be referenced uh, as the, the same in the E-rate program. It's called the Form 471. That's sort of like just an IRS, you know, tax code form. Uh, the E-rate Form 471 is being used for this new ECF program. So there'll be a filing window that will open this summer, again, around July. It'll be open for 45 days. Uh, you, it will probably close by the middle of August. And during that time frame, all uh, public and private K through 12 schools that qualify for E-rate funding, uh, as well as all public library systems that qualify for E-rate funding, will have the opportunity to submit an application for these uh, hotspots or laptop computers, or in, in a few limited cases, even the opportunity to extend their network to a student uh, that lacks uh, any kind of connectivity uh, options at, at their home. So uh, it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll, it's still sort of unfolding as we speak. Uh, the actual application 
uh, has not been approved, but uh, the E-rate program administrator USAC is building the online application portal that's going to be used to submit those applications sometime this summer. So if I'm a K-12 school or a library and I'm ramping up to apply, what, um, what should I do now to get ready? Do I have to collect demographic information? Do I have to already be an E-rate? Do I have to get that form 471 and do all my all my groundwork to fill that out? What you know, if you were a school and you had just seen this this funding come through or just learned about it, what what would be like the top three or four steps that you would take to get ready to apply? It, this is a very challenging season. Uh, you know, there are all these different opportunities sort of coming at schools and libraries. Again, it's it is a, it's a great problem to have. Uh, you know, I would rather have this problem than other problems, but it, it, there is a lot coming at them. So triaging this is very important. Uh, there are a few things the FCC has done to help reduce the stress and the strain on uh, schools and libraries. Uh, the biggest being the fact that they've eliminated the traditional competitive bidding requirements that we, we that are involved with the e-rate funding process so, so we don't have we don't have to go out to three bid i mean that's that's pretty much stock standard for correct it's it's whatever you have to do locally today you still have to do uh, and in many cases schools are operating you know sort of still kind of under uh, emergency uh competitive bidding rules uh and uh whatever whatever you have to do do it but you don't have to do anything extra so you don't have to post a form 470 uh, there's no mandate for how you select the vendor that you choose uh, the only real requirement is you need to have selected someone and and followed whatever rules are in place today to do that so that's that takes that takes one of the factors off of the plate for these uh, these applicants is they don't have to do the the typical e-rate competitive bidding process but they still still need to be gathering information. So the application will open June 1st or July 1st, approximately. Uh, it will be for the next school year, July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022. So the, the question that the application is asking in essence is this, what, what students, what staff or library patrons do you serve who would otherwise lack sufficient internet connectivity or a sufficient remote learning device when they leave school. Uh, and that's the answer that you need to be investigating today. Uh, you, need to, you need to find out, and again, in many cases, that information is already on hand. So many of the school districts have, over the past year, uh, you know, come to know their students and their staff uh, the, the, the level of connectivity they have in ways that previously they did not, you know, they sort of estimated it before, but now they, they have a pretty good idea, you know, and not only which, which families lack devices or connectivity, they can oftentimes now tell you which neighborhoods, like this community, over, that, that section of land over there doesn't have any coverage, you know, so it's, it's an interesting situation that we now kind of have heat maps for internet access that have been developed in all of these school systems and libraries around the country. So, but taking that information and being ready to answer that question, uh, there is a, a one remarkable difference with the emergency connectivity fund from the E-rate program. Uh, the E-rate program, of course, is a discount program. Schools and libraries pay a portion of the fee for any goods or services delivered in that program. The ECF is a 100% reimbursement program. If, if you have a student, staff member, or library patron who otherwise would lack a sufficient internet access or would otherwise lack a sufficient connected learning device when they leave campus, you can purchase a device or a connection for them and be re reimbursed 100% for that connection or for that device. Uh, there are a few caveats. Uh, they will cap the device, for example, at $400. And if you're purchasing a new Wi-Fi, go ahead. Is that, is that for computers? Computers are four hundred dollars. Yes. So they or will cap, they will reimburse. Tablet. They will reimburse a tablet or a laptop computer up to four hundred dollars. Uh, they will not reimburse for a desktop computer. So it has to be something mobile. Uh, wow, you know, that's progress, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we know they have to fit them in the backpacks. Imagine carrying a desktop computer in your backpack back and forth to school. <laughs> yeah, like the first mobile computers that were like a microwave oven. <laughs> yeah, very huge. They called them mobile computers. Yeah. They <laughs> That's great. So walk me through something. Let's imagine for a second that I'm a library, right? I don't have information on what my patrons have at home. How do I, how do I get that information? Do I need them to sign a form? Do I need to send out a survey monkey survey and do just a quick uh, survey of everybody or put it on a, like a computer so that when they walk into the library, they take a survey and they say, yes, I do, or no, I don't have an internet connection at home. And then they qualify for this funding. Is that something I have to do now? Or what yes. qualifies, what constitutes proof if that's part of the requirement? There are uh, pros and cons to the fact that this is just being developed. A pro is uh, that you know the resources are available and it's very much a uh, spirit of the law you know this this is what they are after situation so uh, there that gives that means there's flexibility you know there's not a specific form that you use to capture that data there's not a sp specific form that you use to record that you know that data the downside of that is there's no specific form or, you know, right, <laughs> Melissa, you get it, yeah. you know, like, I get it. I absolutely get it. Uh, the so, pro and the con. Yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 it's two sides of the same coin or a double edged knife, whatever, whatever description <laughs> you want to use. So the, the certification that a school or a library will make is that the users, the students, the school staff, the library patrons would otherwise lack a sufficient connection or, or a sufficient device. And what many of them are looking at doing is uh, creating a paper trail, uh, a, a form, you know, when you, if you check out a device to a student or a teacher or to a library patron that they, that they sign, whether it's electronic uh, kiosk that they fill out or an actual form that they sign, but that you you get them on record saying yes i lack this i don't have this and then keeping that information so that you know if, if you are audited two or three years from now uh that you can the, the, you can demonstrate as a school district or a library system that you know that you took the appropriate steps to make sure that these funds these goods and services were being used appropriately seven billion dollars sounds like a lot of money and it is uh, but when you divide it out by all of the schools, all of the students, all the library branches, it quickly gets down to a number that, you know, on a per student basis or a per building basis, there's not just tons of money to go around. So it's very important that the dollars are targeted to those students, those staff, those library patrons that truly have that need, you know, that when they leave the, the, the campus, they walk into that digital divide, to that gap, to that, that big black hole. And so well, we want to make sure imagine, the dollars are in there. Mm -hmm. I could imagine that might be true if everybody applied. What do you think the chances are of getting a lot of schools to apply for the fund or even know about it? We've talked to so many people out there, so many school systems that are that are saying, oh, seven billion dollars? What's that? Tell us about that. And they're just in that sort of exploration stage, discovery stage of trying to figure out, oh, there's a fund there. And then suddenly they're going to have to do a needs assessment, which is what you just described, you know, figuring out where the need is. And then that application window is going to come up so fast because a lot of the schools are going to be on vacation in a week or two. I mean, we're not far off vacation. It's Memorial Day. So, um, so yeah. So uh, I think that the, it, the, the timing is very challenging. It's a short time frame. The, the application window is going to be probably the month of July by and large, which historically is oftentimes when you know that's if there's a time that things slow down a little bit for the school district a lot of a lot of the administrative staff take vacations that month you know it's uh the something like a school board meeting even if you've got to award a contract and get a school board to signature there's some real logistical challenges yeah that takes a month at least maybe. yeah so it, it's now the flip side of that is this is a one-time program. It's a one-time opportunity. And we know that the, the need is real. It's a profound need yeah. uh, for the students with that, that are 
are left on the wrong side of the digital divide. And the fact that it's 100% reimbursement means if you can if you can document the need and and select a vendor, find a way to, to get it done, you can get 100% reimbursement, uh, which is unreal. And, and it's not a forever program. It's a one-time program, but it will cover the next school year, July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. And how, how incredible that at least for the next school year, we know that uh, you can get connections, get devices into the hands of students. Now, one of the questions we've been getting a lot, and uh, I think a, an easy misconception uh, is uh, a school that is now returning to in-person instruction. And they're hopeful that this next school year is gonna be 100% in-person. Does that school district still qualify for this new ECF program? And the answer is yes. Uh, the program is not limited to hybrid learning or 100% remote learning scenarios. It is really intended to help bridge the digital divide, the homework gap, uh, and it is, it is not limited to uh, only uh, remote instruction. Uh, there is a, a realization that education is taking place, uh, you know, t t t t at all hours, all locations, yeah. and, this, and this program is intended to bridge that gap. So you could have an, a, a school district that is 100% in-person next school year, and I hope they are, applying for Wi-Fi hotspots and connected learning devices for their students, staff that would otherwise lack access to sufficient internet access and su sufficient devices when they leave the school. You know, the, the thing you can't apply for under this, you can't request, for example, Chromebooks that will be on campus 100% of the time. So if you want a car or with, something. With, yeah, a car with laptops in it, that doesn't qualify for ECF, look elsewhere. But if you're looking at providing devices to students that leave the school and don't have access when they leave the school building, Absolutely. So you could be 100% in person and still requesting Wi-Fi hotspots and connected learning devices under the ECF. That's uh, fantastic. And, and the last thing I'll say is all of these terms, they all start with E, right? It's like e ray <laughs> ESSER, ECF. It's so... Uh, what do the E stand for? <laughs> email? Email. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I... we. The next act, the next thing Congress does, they need to choose another letter, you know, stop putting right. e in front of everything. But start a petition for that, couldn't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. petition the non e petition. <laughs> so I, I have a question for you. What I'm hearing is the two things I need to do as a school district to prepare, like today, is I need to do a needs assessment. So I need to find out how many kids don't have connectivity at home or library patrons don't have connectivity at home. So and, there's some and the word is sufficient. Uh, you know, sufficient, sufficient. adequate, that is that the standard. Uh, and, and that goes also to the devices. Uh, you know, oftentimes I get, I get this question. And we've got these devices. Uh, we bought them four years ago. They were for in class and they don't, they don't work. Like kids take them home. They can't do video conferencing. They, we can't even update them to the operating system that they need to be, uh, right. you know, those are not sufficient devices. So the, the key, the threshold here is a sufficient connection, a sufficient device. Uh, so you just have to set aside what maybe even exists and say, is this adequate? And, and that is the question that you have to ask. That's the, that's the assessment that has to take place today is what, is what is sufficient, what is adequate to support remote learning? So when a student or a staff member or a library patron is off campus, can they still connect? Can they still involve themselves in educational activities? And if they can't, then a new device, a new connection is warranted and it will qualify for a reimbursement, again, subject to a few cost limitations. Well, those are completely different survey questions than I would have asked. You know, do I have sufficient connectivity? Do I have a sufficient device? So looking ahead we're definitely going to do a webinar on how to craft a needs assessment survey uh, for schools and do some examples so that'll be coming up uh, later in the solving the digital divide series so watch for that 
Um, my second question was, uh, if my first thing is, is getting vendors or doing the needs assessment, and my second thing is getting vendors, let me look at that needs assessment piece for a second. And I wanna ask Melissa a question about, if I had that needs assessment data, does that help me with all these other grants that we're gonna talk about? Is that something everything. that- Everything. It yeah, helps like with everything. So, I mean, to, to John's point, July is a hard month for education. I mean, if you're gonna be able to bug out and let's just be honest, we all need to bug out at this moment in time. So um, I, I get it. But um, the thing you with don't, grants, you don't mean like right now, right, Melissa? Like right, we like, don't mean okay. right now, right now. I mean, well, bye, guys. I'm done. We'll see. It is. It is a holiday. Let's. <laughs> well, it is. It's a holiday weekend. No. But absolutely, those needs assessment will cover you. I mean, or give you. John mentioned when uh, one of the pros and the cons of this emergency funding is the lack of guidance or, or very clear, this is, this is, this is not, this is the standard, this is what you need, which is great because it does allow that flexibility. But it, as you mentioned, Heather, it is a little bit scary and daunting. These are federal funds. Are we doing this right? Are we obeying the rules? And so more information is more information and um, it is gonna cover you and, and provide a narrative, a story, some documentation, to demonstrate the need across multiple programs, whether it's it's the ECF or it's a competitive or discretionary grant program, whether it's a justification for other stimulus funding when, when we get into things like ESSER and GEAR, um, th those are all absolutely not a, w a waste of time. I, I talk to a lot of folks who are applying for a grant and they think, oh my gosh, if I put all this work into applying for this grant and we don't get funded, like, oh, it'll have been such a waste. And, it, and it's not because there are always grants. There's always funding. And, and one of the things that I, I think John made a really good point is, is not everything is going to be covered under ECF. You know, there are a lot of funds that Yes, it, it will fund the, the hotspots and the laptops, but it's not going to fund those video conferencing technologies. It's not going to fund the licensing. It's not going to fund the contractor's fee to come in and help design those things. So looking at funding from a strategy perspective. And so offering a webinar to be able to highlight how do we create that needs assessment is something that's going to serve an organization well into the future across multiple opportunities. Are there pieces of data that you constantly need as a grant writer that schools never have or libraries never have? And it's always like, if I could just get everybody to gather the demographic data or the needs data, you know, why doesn't anyone do that? You know, is there that frustration point somewhere that we can say, hey, if you're gonna do a needs assessment data, add in these two questions right now and you'll set yourself up for future funding. Absolutely. And so I would love to be a part of that webinar because I feel like I could spend the next 30 minutes to yeah, right. four hours. We got to stay away from this that. topic because we'll be on this for an hour. So. But I, I do think also that John made a very good point when it came to, to being a hard time of year and just the amount of funding available is it's like these organizations are sipping from a fire hose at this point. Yeah. It's just like, it's huge, oh, do we want to apply it? for this? Or we've got to get this in order. And our state has tasked us with summer school, but we also have to set up X number of classrooms for remote learning. And there are just, there are oh, so yeah. many pots of money. There's so much going on that, that yes, it is, it's very difficult. And I will say, Historically, uh, I'm going to use K-12 specifically because I think I, I think all EDU has there's been a lack of funding across the board. But K-12 specifically have gone from having nothing, doing everything on a shoestring budget, trying to. I mean, the, our educators are. I have four children and full transparency. I don't know how they do it. I was not made to be an educator. I was not made to be an admin because of the frustration. You're tasked with arguably the most important job ever to, to make sure that you're, we're educating the youth of America, but we're not going to give you the, the staff or the money or, or any of the things that you need to do it. So K-12 has gone from 
you know, the, the redheaded stepchild when it comes to funding to celebrities. I mean, some of these allocations are not even being publicly posted anymore because everyone is is dialing for dollars in some capacity and it's not so just schools are going to miss out if they oh, don't hear they're about not, all of these funds they're not and and that's what's so important and and why i'm so grateful for these sort of educational platforms to allow schools to say okay like maybe maybe we should talk to some of these vendors about about the the connections and take advantage of the expertise um to your point heather about you know, really needing sort of a, an aligned team. Um, when in my in my job, and I'm for everyone, I'm so sorry. My name is Melissa Griggs, and I actually work for a grant consulting company called Learn Design Apply. We are contracted with Zoom to provide value added grant assistance as well as other vendors and manufacturers, um, where we can really offer that education of what's eligible, how do you go about getting it, the pre qualification process all the way through post award and implementation. So um, this emergency give you another E, a lot of the, <laughs> the Esther, all of the, the E's for a lot of the stimulus is emergency. It's emergency and it's education. And so, so how schools do we... are in an emergency situation where they go, oh, yes. there's too much funding. I don't know what to do. Then they need to pick up the phone. They do. And <laughs> that's what, that's, and that's kind of where it is, is Historically, when you're talking about technology or licensing or connectivity, you're talking to the IT and the network staff, which yeah. is not, not always, grant writers. they're not, they're not you know. grant writers, but they also aren't always familiar with the programs and the curriculum. And so there is a newer position over the last decade or so that most K-12s or even higher eds have, and that is your instructional technologist. And I love the instructional technologists who are kind of bridging that gap over curriculum and programs and professional development and the actual technology that's going to allow them to connect and best serve their student populations, which, it, which is bridging that digital divide for you know, schools going one-to-one. -one. We need technology in the hands of all of these students. And, um, and what I was prepared to talk about, which I love how organically the conversation has led to this, is it doesn't matter if you have the funding for the technology and the licenses, if no one can connect to you, if you don't have that broadband infrastructure or those hotspots in place, I can have the best laptop in the world at my house and a yeah. great headset that's noise canceling. But if I can't reach my teacher because I have insufficient, and John, I'm so glad you pointed that out, insufficient connectivity. Yeah. Um, and that's, and that's where John's experience and expertise comes in over that documentation of, it might show on this map that I have internet connectivity, but I, I, I have no upload, no download. I can't, I can't actually have an adequate conversation. And for these students um, who, who have been doing remote and, and facing those challenges we're finally seeing what a lot of these students and teachers have been facing for years and no one really cared because they could come into the classroom and get it. And so now I think there are a lot of silver linings of COVID and pandemic. And one of those is, wow, we had issues before a pandemic. Now we all have the issues, you know, and, and that's one of the cool things. I think it was kind of a level set of yeah. nobody has the sufficient technology or systems in place to navigate a fully remote quarantine stay at home orders. And so then the funding follows. And so all those, all those students and communities who had issues prior to pandemic you know, we, we feel them now and now we all have the funding to address it. So Heather, what you're doing and the point of providing that education, how do we do this so that we don't miss this opportunity? Because I do not think we will ever in our lifetime I don't think see so, this no. available no. ever. Well, well, when the funding, when the COVID first hit, Digital Wish went 
and did a research study on how many kids had connectivity at home. And the stories that came back were absolutely appalling. We had schools that would send out like 300 laptops out to uh, students that um, didn't have internet connectivity at home. And then those laptops would come back to the schools. They'd get like a third to a half of them back because the parents wouldn't want the liability of having that machine there. They couldn't connect to the classroom anyway. So it was irrelevant to have that device. And this funding, you know, uh, to John's point of getting the, the ECF fund to bring the laptops and the connectivity down uh, to the home uh, changes the entire environment. It changes the, the whole game. And well, and the, uh, Heather, the, the stakes have changed now because the, the reality is now that we've gone through the past year and, you know, there's been this incredible effort to get devices into students' hands, to get, you know, to bridge the divide a bit. And now so many students will be going back to the school buildings next fall, but they're not returning those devices, you know, and they're not going to roll back that experience. They're going to be happy to be in person, but a lot of the adoption curves that we watched unfold over the past year of really embracing more of the educational technology resources and all of this content and tools that have, have been coming along, but now we just sort of fast forwarded about five or six years in terms of adoption. We're not going to unwind that to 2019 or to 2018. It's it's we're 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 charging right into 2022, and so the expectation now of students, of teachers, of parents, of what can be done and what class is going to look like, is being reset, and this is putting and it's never going back. No, it's, it's not never so unwinding after the, all. The digital things. divide uh, just got deeper for those yeah. that are on the wrong side of it, because now class is gonna be that much more collaborative, online, digital, which is fantastic, you know, great. Uh, and we have to make sure we, we bridge that gap or otherwise those students will fall even further behind in, you know, the, the uh, closing the gap over the next year, they're gonna, it's just gonna broaden because they, they can't participate fully when they leave campus. And so uh, it's it's sort of the best of times and worst of times. And that's why it's so critical that, that we all step up and, and step in where we can to help and support. And I do believe, you know, Melissa uh, talked about just how we have to leverage these programs, these resources. Uh, I was talking to a school district just this week that they're actually looking at laptop computers that cost more than $400. So the ECF, again, caps the reimbursements at $400 for these lear connected learning devices. Oh, and then so, they only have to fund a little, yeah, so a little actually, balance. So what the school district's looking at is using their ESSER funds for the difference. Huh? So can, using can ECF for the like first that? 400, <laughs> and then layering on top of that, the, the ESSER funds for the balance and it was 200 another 200 bucks or something like that but the point there being whether you know whether that's the right solution for your school district or not the point is it, it takes understanding how these programs fit together and 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 just also recognizing that this is these are one-time opportunities and as much as we all sort of want to like do a collective sigh of relief it's just not quite time for that yet because the, the table is now being set for the next school year. And, you know, so much happened the past year. And, and now, thankfully, we've got these resources. But the work really begins today for uh, successfully turning this corner into 2021 and 2022. 2022. Yeah. Um, say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, it's 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 very challenging and and you know and it, it really takes a village takes all of us sort of locking arms to figure out okay where can we plug this in how can we do that uh so that the students are connected and the the other side of that i'll put on my e-rate hat for just a second the the school districts are confronted now with this reality that they're going to have twice as many devices in some cases on campus and we, you know, we've all been in a Starbucks or somewhere that the Wi-Fi 
was a little wonky that it uh, this the downloads aren't working. Well, why? We'll look around. There's a bunch of people in here. Everyone's got their laptops out. There's not enough Wi-Fi. Now that the expectations have been reset, those students all come back. They get their laptops out. They're used to streaming stuff. They're going to want that same experience in class. And so just at the same time that we have to think about the off-campus connections and the adequacy, sufficiency of those connections, schools are scrambling to make sure that their on-campus connections are ready. They have to increase. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not like, a, okay, it's one or the other. It's, a, it's, it's both. It's all the above has to be ready for all these extra devices and all the extra bandwidth requirements. That's and John, to that yeah, oh, ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and to John's point, not even just the laptops. And as we mentioned, there's no there's no going back. I mean, a lot of this emergency relief funding was so that you know we could we could put these systems in place so that the next pandemic or the next snow day, everyone can still connect. Everyone can still do that. So even if it is not a global pandemic that is the issue, um, a very recent example was I sit in North Carolina where the last couple of weeks, we were one of the 13 states in a huge gas shortage. Well, we had county school districts say, okay, we're going remote. You guys don't have gas. Parents don't have gas to get kids to and from school. So it's like no excuses. There's no excuses anymore to not have those connections. And because districts and higher education alike they need to keep they need to keep tuition they need to keep the higher ed needs tuition school districts are are funded you know bottoms in seats and so they they want to keep those students in in the district not going to a, a different school system so that they can get a better connectivity so i think school districts as well are going to keep that hybrid learning modality or at least some virtual option for those students who choose not to come back to school as they don't want to lose those students to a program that will allow that student to be remote. So it's not even just the in-person students bringing those laptops back in. A lot of folks are enabling distance learning classrooms and that's, that's bandwidth as well. I mean, there's there's a lot of technology that's going to happen. And John, that's a great point. And it's, it's not just the connections at home that are going to have to be yeah. adequate and, and prepared for this new normal. It, it's the schools themselves that will need to make sure they have that proper connectivity. Well, it's a big in ecosystem discussion, which I hadn't put together with all these different funding sources. And I'm actually excited you're taking it in that direction because uh, John's talking about connectivity, laptops, devices. Uh, Melissa, can you go into uh, a little bit more depth what that whole entire ecosystem of funding looks like and what are the other pieces and the other grant funds and, and uh, talk, talk about like the whole picture. Where do we fund what and how do we fund I what? will. Yeah, and if I you might, could just do that the I'm, next 90 seconds or so, that'd be great. Yeah. Just, you know, just a little... <laughs> Sum up three stimul stimulus packages in 90 seconds. Yes, exactly. I will say um, <laughs> because I had I had some slides to share, but I like the conversational flow and because it's all a funding strategy. There is not one funding source that's going to check all of your boxes. Again, right. we mentioned the technology does nothing without the connections. The connections don't matter if you don't have the technology. So it it, it all fits together. Um, but as, as John's discussed the ECF and, and very laptops and tablets up to $400, you know, and E-rate historically has, has frightened districts and, you know, we don't want to step outside of these lines. There's, you know, it's the, I'm from the South, so I say it is or it ain't. Not the case with, with the stimulus funding. It is use case driven and it's all use case driven around continuity of operations. How do we continue to reach students to the best of our ability for high quality synchronous learning experiences? So there's not, there. to John's point, the problem is you have so much flexibility and, and the great thing is you have so much flexibility. So um, if you can make the case for these investments, to navigate pandemic and sustain
sustain your system, your organization through pandemic and beyond, and again, make a sustainable solution, that is what these stimulus funds were made to do. So I am going to try to share, I will consolidate what I was going to do, but just to give you a picture, um, and you tell me, uh, thumbs up for me if you can see some of this content. All right, so I'm going to skip through what I do. We've talked about this. Key phrase is, is continuity of operations. How do we enable hybrid learning by social distancing? Again, you're going to have those students that don't come back into the classroom. You want access to staff and to training. Um, so this is where I'm going to land for just a minute. And for those organizations, and Heather, you mentioned, it's overwhelming you know, what can we do prior to, I think part of, part of the problem is this being overwhelmed. There are too many E-level acronyms that you don't understand what bucket is eligible for what. So I just want to take a minute to kind of level set, make sure everybody's on the same page when it come when we say things like ESSER and HIRF and GEAR and the the EBB or the ECF, you know, this, I, I'm just going to talk briefly about the stimulus packages. And because if, and John, you probably hear this all the time, we're using our CARES funding, we're using our CARES funding, doesn't matter what bucket of money it is, they, everyone a refers lot of to it as CARES think funding. it's all CARES money. It's all, but yeah, it's all it's CARES money. It's like a generic term, it's kind of like Kleenexes now, it's just, it yeah. is. <laughs> Or well, I'm calling it that five years from now, too, and it's uh, completely other funding sources. It's going to be absolutely, we're going to call it CARES. It's the Kleenex. Yeah, we've it's all the got Zoom. CARES money. It's all, yes, it is. It's exactly right. So the very first stimulus package was called the CARES Act. And so out of the CARES Act, you have multiple buckets of money. So for our purposes, what we care about is the Emergency Stabilization Fund. And so that was monies for K-12 organizations, public K-12, for higher education organizations. And then you had gear funding, which was the governor's education emergency relief. And so that was more slated to your non-public schools, your chartered and your private schools. So we have, we have money across under the CARES Act for all of those different verticals, areas of education. But um, they weren't necessarily for technology. They were for they all were general for education. Anything. So the first CARES Act, I mean, for someone who works in grants day in and day out, and we live and die by grant guidance to say, was it budgeted for previously and did, and did it respond to the COVID pandemic? Those were sort of the parameters. So you saw districts, if they were investing in technology, it was more hotspots, laptops. If it at best, it was hotspots and laptops. And, but for the most part, it was plastic shields, PPE, hand sanitizing right. stations. Like it was very, you know, like, Band-Aid fixes. How do we slap a Band-Aid on this and use these funds to, you know, keep the lights on and all of that? I don't think anybody knew how long this was actually going to drag out, which leads us to your point, Heather, to the second stimulus, which was the consolidated. Which most people don't know about the second one. There was That's, a second. There was a yeah. second stimulus. So the first stimulus passed in March of 2020. The second stimulus was signed into law in December of 2020. And so that was the Consolidated Appropriations Act which again gave another round of funding for K-12, and that's what we call ESSER. That is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. So that's, that's your K-12, public K-12 funding. The higher education funding, so, and these are allocation funding. This is, a gear is on its own, but for the purpose of K-12 and higher ed, it was done by allocation. You actually knew based on Title I numbers how much money you were gonna get. It's not a competitive application process. It is you have this money, but you could be audited. And to John's point, more information is more information. How, how did what you choose to spend this money, money on help you, help your students, enable you to navigate pandemics? So that second stimulus though, Heather, 
it had more rules than just they have to respond to pandemic. And I'll actually like pull to a, a second slide. This was from the second, the second stimulus Esther. You needed to coordinate, prepare, you could, I should say, these were priorities, preparedness and response to efforts. Again, continuity of operations, connections, being able to do that, addressing those disadvantaged populations. Um, Purchasing that educational technology is absolutely a priority of ESSER as well. Providing mental health services and support. Now, and this is a great way of saying it's interpretation. It's, it's how your district is choosing. If you're saying every student needs access to a school counselor and a school psychologist, you could interpret that as we need salaries. We need to hire another school psychologist and a school counselor to make sure we have one for every school. Or so back to interpretation again. Interpretation. Yeah. Or I could say I have a, an amazing school psychologist, but she spends the majority of her time traveling between different physical locations. So I'm going to set her up with, you know, some high quality audio and video equipment with Zoom licenses. And I'm going to make sure that I have that same equipment at each school so that she can see every single student she needs to see in one day without the time and resource and cost associated with travel. So, so again, John, is this, what, is this what John, what you were talking about before where I could use my ECF money up to $400 for a device. And then if my laptop actually costs 600, then this is the actual ESSER fund that I would use to then pay that additional $200 or fund that additional so $200. In, in all cases, they sort of want to keep these different funds separated. So the key there is just not overlapping. You know, they want to see that the dollars are kept uh, sort of in their own lane that you can I use see. them in conjunction with each other. So in the, yeah, the example I gave, they're looking at using the ECF funds for the first $400 of the laptop cost. And then the ESSER funds the balance going to that that connection piece, that technology piece. That's um, awesome. That's like the have... one thing. If I get my one thing today, that's a fantastic tip for schools who are facing this and want to buy layer that and, funding. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, advanced and, computers you know, the, 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 the world these teachers are going into uh, next fall is, I'm not going to say it's as challenging uh, as sort of the rush to remote learning, that's going to be very challenging because, again, everything's sort of been uh, scrambled a bit. So I think even around tech technology professional development, uh, you know, the the integration. We're we're talking so much about connectivity and the importance of that. That's you know that's like that's the price of admittance, you know, but that's not the actual show, <laughs> you know? I mean, the show is the teachers leveraging these tools and these resources and being equipped to do so. And, and how you do that in a, in classroom is different. And you can talk to school districts that have spent the last 10 years deploying technology and, and slowly sort of, you know, they integrated it with their eighth graders and then they sort of build it up as they go. That all got collapsed down to, you know, to eight weeks. And so now they're going to be coming back to school and they don't have the benefit maybe of that four year integration process. It's kind of just happened, but yet they still have to integrate it. And, and how does that happen and what resources are available? And so, you know, to, to Melissa's point about, okay, where, where's the need? I think thinking about, all right, it's next October. These students are back in class. They've We've got them devices that they can take off campus, which is great. Now, how are the teachers using this and what resources do they need? And that technology integration piece uh, and what is, what is the new normal look like? It's, it's a good challenge, don't get me wrong, but it is, a, it is a big challenge because we wanna see those tools used effectively. We don't want them seen just sort of as a thing you have to do or something that's gathering dust. We know there's great value in these resources and making sure that the teachers have the have the resources they need, not, you know, not just the technology resources, but the other uh, ped pedagogy, you know, pedagogical, right. is that the right word? Uh, yeah. Resources. Thank you.
No, and and that, it, it's a great <laughs> point. And I think there's, uh, I can't remember the actual term. I talked about my instructional technologist, but there are instructional designers now who are, who are saying, uh, and my mom, I use my real life examples that you, my mom is an educator for 30 years. One of the, I believe one of the hands down, the best teachers that ever teaching remote didn't translate for her. So thinking through those things of, I mean, technology brings its own set of cha challenges, but digital literacy, um, again, that professional development to allow you to, to change your teaching style to, to a, a, one, a hybrid situ situation or a remote or a virtual situation or a combination of both. Um, but when we were in our green room, so to speak, before this webinar, we talked about like cybersecurity and, you know, being able to have those applications to protect our students now that we're, we're giving them this technology and making sure that we're doing it in the most safe and responsible way. And so that's where these, these additional funds for ESSER, the last bucket of money was called the American Rescue Plan. And so the point of that is there are three different packages with three different buckets of money that continue to come for these educations, uh, these education organizations and being able to, to layer and again, make that strategy of, okay, if we're gonna invest in, in the hotspots and, and the laptops, let's also look at making sure we've got the professional development and services and training and those things in place as well to be able to make sure this is adopted by everyone and, and sustained as well. When you're talking about grants and funding in almost every grant program there ever was, there's a section on sustainability. We wanna see if we're giving you this funding that you are, you know, you're gonna be able to use it wisely and be able to sustain it into the future. And to do that, we're all gonna, again, have to work together at leveraging the different opportunities and what's eligible under each of those. So Melissa, can you uh, highlight a few of the other buckets of funding that are available for those other elements in the ecosystem? Because we know ECF covers laptops and hotspots. Now we've, we're looking at ESSER as a sort of overage funding, um, maybe ESSER two. Uh, when do they end? Um, what can we use to, put, to fund something like Zoom? I, we all know we have to have Zoom in our classroom. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so historically, um, prior to I actually did have a job doing this prior to the <laughs> pandemic. And we're looking at foundation, um, state or federal, competitive or discretionary grant opportunities. So those are still available and they're at the, uh, the top of mind. Now it's a little late for this, but if you're investing in a funding strategy, it's definitely something to keep on your plate is a USDA grant through their rural utility service called the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program. And so that is a great example of an opportunity. The kicker is it has to benefit rural communities. So if you're looking at a K-12 and you've got schools on the outskirts and you're having a teacher shortage, you don't have AP or dual enrollment opportunities, this grant program allows you to invest in the technology and equipment. It's purely for a capital expenditure. So you're looking at the hardware, the software, the licenses. Um, if you need some additional connectivity up to 20% can be used for broadband. So that funds, again, the equipment solution. It won't pay for the salaries or those sort of things, but it will pay for the training on that equipment to make sure that it is adopted. Um, so again, I just use that as a quick example because it comes out every year. Currently this year it's due on June 4th. So it'd be really tight turnaround, but those are programs that we've specialized in prior to. When it comes to ESSER, those are very, ESSER is for your K-12. And so that in those buckets of money, it, you would just basically be going to your organization, so the board or whomever to say, how much of these funds have been leveraged? And, you know, their ESSER 1 would have a 2021 expiration date, where ESSER 2 would have a 2022 expiration date, which ESSER 3 would have a 20. 23 expiration date, same for higher education. In higher education, those are our higher ed emergency relief funds that were again given by allocations. 
there and and with most funding you can't get to that second buddy fun uh that second pot of money until you've exhausted the first you can't get to the third until you've exhausted the second is so that again on a school by school basis or it is, it is a or how does it, it is district so when it comes to when it comes to the k-12 so the ESSER funding that is district those are district allocations so again larger districts with more students got larger allocations but also there were allocations made on those Title I numbers as well. And the buckets got bigger, Heather, at every turn. So they got more money from the second stimulus and then even more money from the third stimulus. And so it would be talking to the powers that be or whomever is in charge of, of funneling out these funds to the schools to say, what is available this is what i need to do and it goes back to having that needs assessment and talking to vendors to say this is the challenge we're facing what how much is it going to cost to fix it and what are your suggestions and what else needs to be included because there those are easy those aren't long application processes those are here's my quote here's my justification you know keeping track of the assets that you choose to spend it on and and as John mentioned, it's almost like we could say a kajillion dollars at this point when it comes to the Fed, it, like billions, millions means very little anymore in, in all these different stimulus and a packages. redefined kajillion. <laughs> exactly. I like it's a kajillion. Well, it's just a boatload of money. Just and so get an application to, in. <laughs> yes, to the audit, like we don't know what we don't know. So just keep track of everything, you know, have your justifications, keep track of all quotes and invoices and those sort of thing. For higher education, the same thing you've got, there is money there. And again, not, not all, uh, there are multiple hands in the cookie jar. You know, some people are wanting more staff. Some people are wanting their HVAC upgraded. And because of the flexibility of this funding, you really have to, to go to bat to create that mind share of how this is not only gonna address pandemic and these investments are gonna sustain us and make sure we keep our students and keep our, our, our grades up, you know, keep these kids engaged and, you know, we, we we're already seeing, as John mentioned, this, this gap grow exponentially over the last year for those folks who had resources to invest in their, in, in their students learning and tutors and all of those things. And those who didn't, who, those who were just, you know, at home, no connection, you know, not just losing learning. I mean, we lose so much learning over the summer. Look at the last year and a half. Like I can't even imagine what the that research yeah. is going to look like. Well, let me ask you a question about ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. The yeah. um, um, free and reduced lunch uh, requirements. You had said for the first stimulus package that that was a caveat. Um, or did I misunderstand? But for the latest stimulus, is that a caveat? Has it been considered? Let's say I'm a wealthy school district because one of the things we're finding is the wealthy school districts are having just as many problems as some of the, the uh, minority and underserved districts are because they have inadequate uh, uh, internet connectivity for a lot of the kids at home. Uh, not just lack, but inadequate. The kids are fighting over the single uh, connection with you know not enough bandwidth for multiple Zoom calls going at the same time, that type of thing. So. If I'm a wealthier school district and I don't have a free and reduced lunch uh, requirement, um, where do I start with these with this progression? Uh, the, the, the best thing that you could do if you don't know where the money is and you, you've gone to the top of your district or your school is to go to the State Board of Education because regardless of Title I status or these formula allocations, there should be money available. And you make a really great point that I'll just touch on really briefly. And that is those private and charter schools who, who don't receive those Title I funds always. And so we didn't get an allocation. Where do we go? That's where your gear or your government, edu governor's education emergency relief comes in. And so if you have nowhere else to start, you've gone to your superintendent or the president of your school system, just simply inquire with the State Department of Education, what, how do we access our stimulus funds? Because you're exactly right. It didn't matter whether you were in a very urban area that had poor connection or a rural area that had poor connection. It, it, we're all sort of in the same 
spot. So it might be a smaller bucket of funding, but the funding should be available. Well, we're out of time. And so uh, I'm going to wrap up. Melissa, give us a, a sort of final thought about how you can help schools, uh, what you recommend, um, and then we'll wrap up. Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, I work for a grant consulting company. Um, we, you can always email grants at zoom.us if you have inquiries on, you know, how do I find that bucket of money? And we're more than happy to, to help at least point you in the right direction or give you the information that you need to be able to navigate, whether it's a stimulus funding opportunity or we might determine in our conversation, oh, there's a grant that comes out every year that you would be you would be really primed to apply and receive. So, yep, uh, grants at zoom.us is how you get in touch with me. Awesome, great. And John, how about you? What uh, what's your final thought before we uh, before we sign off here? Well, I think uh, two things. First of all, uh, you know, if you do have specific questions about the Emergency Connectivity Fund, you can go to fundsforlearning.com slash ECF. We've got resources there to help kind of walk you through it. And I think the last thing I would like to just say is a word of encouragement. Uh, you know, we, we have such a great opportunity in front of us. We know the need is real and, uh, and now there are resources available. And we all have a responsibility to step up to this moment, really to live up to the potential of this moment. And I think it's for two reasons. Number one, the immediate need to connect those students, to keep them connected, to equip the teachers with the resources that they need. Obviously, that's the immediate need. Also, the applications that are submitted, the, uh, the inventories, the assessments that are provided will provide the data that is used to inform future policymaking, that is used to inform the next generation of, of grant opportunities. And so we have, I think, an obligation to help those students today by submitting an application and submit and help the students tomorrow by submitting an application because what's tallied up today, what's utilized today is going to be looked at and, you know, a year from now, two years from now, policymakers will look back and say, hey, we we made this money available and either a uh, you guys didn't need it. Right. Because you didn't apply for it, which we all know is not the case. That hurts well, my heart to hear you. Yeah, say that. Or they're, or they're going to say, <laughs> wow, look, we put this money out there and oh, wow, it was gone fast, you know, and so uh, the need is real and we need to help document that need. Uh, so that's I, I would just say and which is why we all need to be joining forces and reaching out to whatever resources you need uh, to, to make sure you're you're submitting those applications and getting those requests in on time so that we can help the students help the teachers the library patrons and and help the future uh, students and so on uh, on the next round of applications awesome thank you john i just want to say that there's a kajillion dollars out there and we need to apply for it and if we don't all go for our part of a kajillion dollars, we are uh, not going to get it. You have to play to win, as they say. So I would like to invite anybody who's listening to play to win and to, to take a look at all of these grant opportunities and find something, anything that, you know, some piece of that ecosystem that you qualify for and go for it. I mean, worst case, they say no, right? So, um, and if you need help, call Melissa or call John or uh, send a message to that Zoom address and, um, you know, get help. There's help out there uh, to help you get through this process. So a little bit of housekeeping, the Solve the Digital Divide series will continue on. Keep checking back. We're going to do more fireside chats and uh, have more webinars coming up on funding, on what to do with the funding once you get it on corporate help uh, if corporations want to uh, throw in and and help with donation programs how to set those up so there is a lot of funding out there let's all uh, share information and apply and go get our piece of a kajillion dollars so with that i'm going to say thank you and let's all solve the digital divide together all right thanks Thank you all.